Well, praise God. I'm excited this morning. I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of taking off of the message that I had preached uh, the other day. I, I get mixed up on how many messages I've preached and where I'm at, so you all just have to just follow along in your notes. And uh, if, I, if I'm preaching some of the same things again, just, you know, bless me and learn it again. But, you know, I preached a message here a while back called Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. And uh, I, I, I've heard a, a lot of comments about that. A lot of people were blessed by it, and I know that everybody hadn't heard it. And so I kept looking back over my notes and looking back over what the Lord was saying to me, and then I keep getting more stuff and more stuff. And so th- this is a, I got a new title this morning uh, to an old message. So the title to this message this morning is The Rise and the Fall of Man. But it's tied into that message on Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. And see, what happens to most of us in life is that you in life, you will never rise above the level of doubt in God. Listen to what I said. You're never going to rise above the level of your doubt in God. You say, well, I don't doubt God. Sure we do. All the time and everything that we do in, uh, in all of our days, we have doubt in God. He said, no, I don't. Listen, anytime you don't believe in what the Word says about your life, you're having doubt in God. You don't really believe God can perform what He said He could do. When you pray about a situation, but then you worry, that's doubt. So in your whole life, everything that you do, you're never going to rise above your doubt that you have in God. So what do we have to do? We have to change our level of the knowledge of Him. You follow what I'm saying? We have to change the level. So what most of us do in life, we don't gain knowledge. We don't seek God. We don't, we don't, we seek him, but only in a, on on a level of your daily needs. We don't seek to know him to the level that it changes our way of thinking about God or our life or situations or circumstances. And so what happens to us is we live our lives, like the message I preached before, looking into the mirror. And all we ever do in life is look into the mirror and we look at ourself and our face and our faults and our weaknesses and our thinking. And we look at that and you never rise above that. And it becomes our life. It becomes everything about us. It becomes who we are. Because we're looking at the mirror and the secret is is to gain the knowledge of God that God's not interested in what you think about you. God's interested in what you think about him. Did you get that? He's not interested in what you think about you. Because if you're, if you're just do nothing but spew negative out of your mouth, you, he, you're, inhibit, you're in, inhibiting the, him from moving in your life. He's interested in what do you think about him. Come on now, church. God's interested in what do you think about him. Do you think he is the great I am? Do you really believe that he is the God that parts the Red Sea, but he is the God that will part the sea in your life? Do you really believe that you're blessed in the city and blessed in the field and blessed when you come and blessed when you go? Or do you believe when you walk out in the world that everybody's against you and everybody's going to come against you and you're going to have a hard time in life and you're going to struggle through life and you're probably going to get cancer and die? I'm telling you, man, this world is a sick place. They tell you you want to get older so you can retire, but then they tell you when you're going to retire, you're going to probably die of some sort of cancer. I mean, you just, go look, just go look up statistics. I had a person tell me the other day, he said, you know, you really shouldn't ride a, a Harley, because I ride a Harley. And uh, they said, you really shouldn't do that because older men, it's known that a Harley, if you're riding a motorcycle, it, it can cause you to have prostate cancer. <laughs> and I said, really? Did you know that you also look on that statistic? And most men, almost 100% of them, that got prostate cancer wore socks. <laughs> so if we just want to get our figuring right here, okay, let's just get our statistics right. You know, it's bull. But if you wake up every morning and think, oh, my God, I'm going to get on my motorcycle. I'm going to get prostate cancer. I mean, what kind of stupidity is that? You all with me here? But the world is geared that way. The world is geared to just, 
It just pump, pumps garbage to you, basically, so that you'll rely more on it. You're never going to rise above your level of doubt in God, church. If you want to be more than a conqueror, if you want to be an overcomer, you're never going to rise above the doubt. Here's a good example. Uh, Rhonda just told me that the, the Utopia EMS, that they were just voted that they were the, the, the best, the, the highest level of uh, rural EMS care in the state. Okay? Now, how did that happen? If they got out there every day and they said, oh, well, you know, we can't do anything. We're just a little town. We can't do anything. It's going to be wonderful. We can just get anybody to the hospital before they're dead. You know, I mean, we can't do nothing. I mean, my God. I mean, what am I, you know, we're not going to make it. I mean, go into town. Everybody say, well, how y'all doing? I don't know. Pretty bad. You know, I don't know if we'll make it or not. You think they'd ever got there? Absolutely not. You're never going to rise to the level above your, your, your level of doubting God. I'm telling you, church. Okay. Our world is framed, listen to me, our world is framed by our input of knowledge. Hear what I'm saying. You think, listen. uh, I told my wife, I said, I want to preach this message and it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. But I'm going to be frustrated through the whole thing. Simply because I know that most people that listen to that watch me on video or listen to me over audio are never going to do what I say. Because the bottom line is we human beings, we don't want to change. We don't want to change. And we don't want to put forth the effort to change. But I'm telling you in life, you cannot get to heaven. I'm stating this as an ambassador of Jesus. I'm saying this seriously as an ambassador of Jesus. You're not going to be able to get to heaven and point the finger at God and say, why didn't you do this? He is going to be justified and and have no guilt or shame on God's part because he said, I gave you everything. I gave you everything. So it's up to us as sons and daughters of God, those that are believers in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to learn everything that we possibly can and to begin to frame our worlds not by what the input of knowledge this world has given us, but frame our worlds by what the Word of God says about our lives. There's a big difference. Now, let me, I'll give you this example because I was thinking about this message and talking about my wife and this is kind of really funny, but it's, it's the truth. Okay, I'm 50, about to be 52 years old, and I have never in my life used an ATM machine. How many of y'all in here use an ATM machine on a regular basis? Raise your hand. Okay, so we've got some hands to be right here. I've never used an ATM machine. Don't have any earthly idea how they work. Matter of fact, I went to the bank with my wife, and she was trying to show me how to do this and I thought the screen was a touch screen you know and I couldn't make the thing work and come to find out it was push button and it wasn't touch screen anyway so but yet there's people all day in the city that use ATM machines all the time now I have a I have a card you know I have a a, a, a debit card and I could draw money out of an ATM machine but I don't know how to do it are y'all with me you know how I do it I do it just like my daddy did it I go to the bank. I walk up to the teller and say, here, I want to write out a check. And I write me a check out. And I slide that puppy across and say, I want it in tens and twenties. Uh Are y'all with me? Why do I do that? Because my daddy did it. From the time I was a little boy, I saw him go in the bank and get cash. Are y'all with me? I... That knowledge was input to me. Now there's a new way you can do it. Cash is out there everywhere. It's called this ATM machine. You take the card, you put it in, you do the little deal, Papa. Whoop, comes out cash. I haven't learned to do it. Listen, I haven't learned to do it. And I'm probably not going to. All right, I'm probably not going to. You know why? Because something on the inside of me says something's going to go wrong. And either all the money in my account is going to come pouring out the chute or somebody's going to come up next and take all the money out of my account because I did something wrong. Right? I mean, that's what... I, I, and so I'm trapped in this world. Now, this could be of a use to me. 
Are y'all with me? But I don't use it. There's Christians walking in this world. They got the all-knowing credit card from heaven. The, all the promises are yours. Ephesians 1 says that you are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Every. How much is every? It's all of it, right? Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places is already here. You got the card. But if you don't go learn to use it, you don't understand how God's ways work, well, then you know what? You don't get the benefit of it. Are you still a card holder? Yes. Do you still have money in the bank? Yes. You see what I'm saying? You, it's there. All the things are right. See, I got the money in the bank. I got the card. And I could get it out of the deal, but I don't go to the third step. I don't learn how to do it. And truthfully, the only reason why I got a card is because they gave me a card. I was in a place the other day and went out to write out a check, and they looked at me like I was doing something scandalous. I said, check? I says, uh, what's wrong with my check? Are you all following me here? But see, my knowledge input limits me from what I can partake of. Your knowledge input of God limits you to what you can partake of in the kingdom of God. God is not withholding anything from you. Listen to me. God is not withholding anything from you. He is not keeping anything back from you. He is not looking at you saying, well, they don't deserve it. They're not, they're not good enough. I don't know. They ain't made the A cut, you know. I, you know. No. Listen to me. God is so crazy. He is so wild with his love and his grace that he said, if you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you believe he died for you and you believe he rose again from the grave, you then get it all. At that moment, at that second, you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can't get more righteous. Listen to me. You cannot get more righteous. Well, I don't know, Pastor. You know, I was raised where, you know, you have to, you know, you, you need to do you know, good things and you have to be a good person before God's really going to bless you. Okay, so your input's wrong. I'm just telling you, input's wrong. Go read the Bible. You can argue me all day long. Listen, somebody cannot like me. Might not like the way I look, not like the way I dress, not like who I am. But I want to tell you something. I'm preaching the Word of God. I believe in a good old-fashioned gospel. And the Bible, I just read my Bible and preach what it says. Hello? You can't argue with it. Go argue with the Word of God. That's what I tell them all the time. Go argue the Word of God. Well, you know, under the... Now, listen to me. I don't care about who interpreted what. I'm talking about let's read the Bible and see what the Bible says. And the Bible says you're either righteous or you're not. Hello? I got another whole message. And I got another one just a second ago sitting there. And so I got three things stirring around the inside of me. But listen to me. I'll just give you a little, little hint. Do you know this morning that God has faith in you that you're going to make it? No, do you really understand that? God Almighty sitting on the throne is believing in you that you are more than a conqueror. That you are an overcomer. He by faith is operating believing in you. <laughs> so you think nobody believes in you this morning? God believes in you. Matter of fact, he believed in you so much he sent Jesus to save you. Wow. Wow. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, you can find it over in Matthew 8, 23, where Jesus is asleep in a boat and they're crossing the sea of Galilee. And they get in a storm. And the boat's being tossed. And the disciples say, we're going to drown. Why did they say that? Because they were fishermen. They'd been out in the, in the, in the sea before. They'd been out there before. They'd, see this, they'd seen boats turned over. They'd see people drown. They'd seen this. What they saw had framed their world. They'd never seen anybody stand up on a boat and say, peace be still, and the sea, sea calmed. They'd never seen that. They'd never heard of anybody doing that in, in it, you know, I guess they could, have, they could have gone back to Moses and he parted the Red Sea. You know, they had those writings those, the, 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 that was there in the Torah. But they're on the boat and they're like us. They're just like us, those disciples were. 
The sea is tossed, it's turning, it's boats going, they're bailing water. Some of them are bailing, some of them are rowing. Some of them are probably more freaked out than others. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. Now, was Jesus' part of the boat being tossed in the sea? I mean, he wasn't just, his cushion wasn't floating above, you know, just... He was in as big a mess as they were, right? But he was asleep in it. Just resting. And if you read through the, the, the deal, he, he gets up and he says, but he said to them, why are you fearful? Oh, you have little faith. It never dawned on anybody in the boat that Jesus was with them. It never dawned on anybody in the boat to just say, I mean, Jesus is with us. Come on, guys, how bad can it be? I mean, we've got the Son of God in the boat with us. It never dawned on any of them to say that. It never dawned on any of them. Because why? They looked. And what they saw, what they felt, what they smelt, what was going on, and what they knew of the knowledge on the inside of them is how they were living at the moment. They were not operating by faith in that Jesus was in the boat with them. He said, yeah, pastor, but that's the disciples and Jesus in the boat with them. He said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He said, matter of fact, he's coming to live in your house. Your temple. He says, you are the temple of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God lives in you. How close is Jesus? He's in you. If you're a believer in him. So if your boat's getting tossed, he's in the boat with you. Well, it just doesn't work like that. No, that's what your knowledge limits you to. Are y'all hearing me this morning? It's what your knowledge limits you to. You're still looking in the mirror, just looking at your faults and your, 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 your inconsistencies and your problems, and you're just looking in that mirror at that, and that's all you're seeing. You're not seeing the Word of God for what the Word of God is. You're not seeing that and really truly believing that the Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth, is on your side. How do I know that? Because I'm just like you. I can't point the finger at you because I'm just like you. And how I know where my level of faith is, is by what is coming out of my mouth. Hear me? I know the level of my faith by what's coming out of my mouth. Because the confession of our mouth determines our walk in life. See, what happens to us is we say, we start out in the morning, we say, I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the field, I'm blessed when I come and when I go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And we walk outside and you got a flat tire. And you say, Dad, I said I was blessed, I'm not blessed, I got a flat tire, I got to change it. So then the rest of the day, the devil works on us and says, see, God didn't take care of you. You were saying you were blessed, but you weren't really blessed. You walked outside, you weren't really blessed. See, you didn't really walk in the blessings of God because they're not really up on you. Because you know why? Because basically you're a sinning dog. <laughs> you know, you're not really too good. You know, your mother didn't have it right, and she didn't really get it down good, and so she didn't really pass it on to you, and so you didn't really have it. And so, so you know, it's kind of a generational curse there. You know, that's what it is. You know, that's all it is. And so you know what happens? That's what comes out of our mouth. Well, I guess that's right. So then we start just speaking it out of our mouth. Then our ears hear it. And when our ears hear it, it gets down in our heart. And when our heart hears it, it produces doubt. Because your heart is either going to produce faith or it's going to produce doubt. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. In this world. Thank God in the next, I don't have to worry about it. But in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But it's going to be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. In other words, no matter what, so there was a flat tire. Maybe you needed the time to fix the flat tire so you weren't run over by a truck at the stop sign. We don't ever think about it like that. We're just mad because we had to get out and get hot and sweaty and 
Maybe you had an ugly shirt on and you needed to get it dirty and change. Oh, here you go. Maybe you had the wrong color shirt on and God had spoke to somebody else to give somebody $1,000 the first one they saw that day in a white shirt. Oh, oh, oh. he said, oh, I don't know about that. Well, come on. Don't we live in a supernatural blessing? Maybe you had the wrong shirt on. But see, we don't look at it like that. We're just mad because we had to fix a tire. Why? Because we've already set up the way that we thought the day should go. Because we are set ourselves up as God, not letting God be God. We've set ourselves up on our own ivory throne. And we sat there and said, this is the way it's going to go. And when it didn't go the way we wanted it to go, immediately we think, God with the big G is not on the throne. Well, he couldn't be because God with a little G, you were on your throne. And you know where you are in your life because of what's coming out of your mouth. I have caught myself. I've learned to catch myself. And I've learned to stop. And when I hear it coming out of my mouth, I've learned to stop and say, you know, I I, I just rebuke that. Robert, you are a fool. Shut your mouth. That is not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says I'm blessed. The Word of God says everything I put my hand to is going to prosper. The Word of God says that I'm, I'm wealthy, blessed, and healthy. The Word of God says that I'm an overcomer. The Word of God says I'm more than a conqueror. That's what the Word of God says. And God says that He's able, according to Philippians 1 and 6, that the, to perfect the good work that's been started in me. So you're going to get me through this thing, Lord, and I'm going, to be a, I'm going to overcome. I'm going to be a son of God. I'm going to walk on the face of the earth like I'm supposed to. And then all of a sudden, see, my ears begin to hear what's coming out of my mouth, and then my heart begins to produce the faith that it's supposed to produce because your heart is the faith producer of your life. But it can't produce faith if all that comes out of your mouth is doubt. And see, what happens is, 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 is we won't say, well, that's just the power of positive thinking. I'm not talking about thinking. I'm talking about confessing. I'm talking about believing what the Word of God says. I'm talking about putting your faith in your great God who is your Father that can bring all things to pass. Can anybody in here really tell me how hair grows? I mean, seriously, any of y'all ever really thought and uh, the breakdown of how a hair grows out of a pore in your skin? Y'all are all looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> Don't really think about it too much, do you? You just know that when your hair is long, when you look in the mirror, you want to go get a cut or it doesn't lay right or this or that or the other. Am I right? We don't really go to the in-depth process of how did this hair grow. You don't go to your barber, your beautician, and sit down and say, well, the, the, the molecule, molecule cells have been growing and forming, and therefore I need this to be cut. <laughs> you don't look at the science behind your hair growing. You just go get it cut, right? So it is with the Word of God. I don't really understand all the science behind the supernatural. But I just know what works. And I just walk in it. I walk in it because it works. I walk in it because I know that I have to change my level of the knowledge of input. Listen to me. If you've always had a bad family, if you've always been in a bad family situation, your family's dysfunctional. They yell and scream and fight and throw things at each other. You're going to have the tendency to think that's the normal way a family should be. And so you're going to go right in a deal. You're going to yell and scream and fight and throw stuff at each other because that's the knowledge you have put in your brain. That's what you're going to confess. That's what you're going to function in. Unless you change it. And like I said, the sad thing is most people don't want to change. They want the world to adapt around them. They want the world to change and adapt around them rather than them becoming who? Jesus wants them to be. And we always think that if everybody around us would just change, then our life would be better. Am I preaching good this morning? 
But the truth of the matter is, the world, the responsibility of the world changing around you is not yours. The only thing, only person that you can change is you. And the only person you can do anything with is you. Now you can help others, you can tell other people knowledge, you can tell other people things, but you can't let them, you can't make them apply it. You lead the horse to the water, but you, he's got to drink. Have y'all ever tried to make a horse drink? I tried one time. You know, we were riding and we were rounding up cattle and I figured the horse needed to drink water. And I went over there to get it in the trough. He didn't want to drink, you know. I said, well, stupid, we're getting ready to go back out. If you want to drink water, you better get one now. So I thought, you know, they always said you lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I said, I bet I can shove his head down that water. <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> didn't work. I mean, you'd have thought I had a, a, a bucket of snakes I was trying to shove his head in. Well, just like with us as Christians, I can tell you all the good news. I can tell you all the things of the Word of God. I can lead you and point you in the right direction. But unless you apply it to your life, it ain't going to do any good. And it's not that I told you wrong information. It's that you didn't apply it. Go to Matthew chapter 15. So the rise and the fall of man all has to do with our confession. Do you hear what I'm saying? Your rise and your fall all has to do with what are you saying out of your mouth. Matthew 15, verse 10, it says, When he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles the man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know what the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Because, see, they were mad because they were, wanting, they were telling the disciples that they should, shouldn't eat before they'd wash their hands and had to ritualistically wash their hands a certain way. Well, that wasn't in the Bible. It didn't say anything about that. It was one of their traditions. Jesus said, Man, you guys got it all wrong. So he says, he answered, said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters a man's mouth goes into his stomach and is eliminated? And those things which proceed out of his mouth come from the heart. And they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, fault, wis- false witness, blasphemes. These are the things that, can, that defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Jesus says, what's coming out of your mouth that's getting you in trouble? In my paraphrase. He said, the problem is with your mouth. Because if your mouth is lined up right, then your ears will hear the word of God coming forth and then faith will be produced in your heart. It works that way, folks. It just, there's no other way. The heart is the mechanism in your life. I'm not talking about your pumping heart. I'm talking about the, the, the spiritual heart that's in you. When it hears the word of God coming out of your mouth, it c- goes down into your ears, hits your heart, and then your heart begins to pound faith that you believe in God, that you're trusting in him. He said, well, I mean, that's all I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying. We just keep saying, yeah, but, you know, well, I don't know. That's not how I learned it. Well, it's not what they said. Well, you know, I'm a, meh, 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 meh. And the angels of heaven look down at the sons of God and say, what the heck is the matter with them boys? And our heart is so confused, it doesn't know what to do. See, I don't know what it is with our human nature. The Bible says that whatever we put our hands to is going to prosper. Okay? Now... You know, if, 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 if you want to do something that's totally, completely unrighteous, doesn't honor God at all, you know, and you put your hand to that, I don't see how it can prosper. But I'm talking about 
just the businesses and the normal things that we do. It says if you put your hands to it, it'll prosper. But what happens to us then is we say, well, was this really the will of God? Is this the right thing to do? Is this what we should have done? I don't know. But this, we start automatically talking ourselves out of whatever we put our hands to and reasons why it should prosper or not. Well, but you know, things are hard. Economic times are hard. I, the Bible doesn't say anything about economic times. Matter of fact, the Bible says that Isaac sowed seed in a famine and produced a hundredfold return. The Bible doesn't say that we're supposed to live our lives by the, the, the economic time clock and destiny of what's going on in the world. It says that we're supposed to live by putting our hands to whatever and prospering. Oh, there's things about that that all fit in. You know, there's other things. You've you got to be a tither and a giver and a blesser and desire the things of God and all that kind of stuff. And you'll always prosper, no matter what the times are. But what I'm saying to you is, church, we don't, we are so humanized that we don't believe what the Word of God says. We believe it as fairy tales. We believe it as good stories. We believe it as, yes, that's good wisdom, yes, yes. But to apply it to our life as a, a life-giving principle, we usually don't do that. And we're wrong. And if you want to rise in your life instead of fall, you've got to line your words up, your confession up with the Word of God. You've got to sow seeds into your heart that are full of faith. It's not magic. It's not mystical. It's not hocus-pocus. It's called... Faith in a supernatural God. How many of y'all have ever seen air? Do you look out the window in the morning and see if you can see air before you walk out to see if you can breathe? No, we pretty much assume that air is going to be available to us during the day. Right? There's so many things that we do. Now listen. Listen. Let me, let me go back. Let me go back to my example on uh, ATM machines. You know, I've walked by hundreds of them. And I walk by, I think, yeah, they say you can get something out of there, but I might as well go to the bank. You all with me? Okay. But when I walk up to the bank and I, you know, check my accounts and I know I have money in the bank, and I walk up there and I want to cash my check. There's no doubt in my heart that I'm going to get money. You follow what I'm saying? There's no, there's no reserve. Oh, gosh. I hope they'll give it to me today. When I go to the window, what if they don't? I had to sit out in my truck and build my faith. Okay, they really will. I know this is how it works. This is what they said. I had this check, but I made it down. I know they have money's in the account. I know. I really believe in. Oh God, I just believe you. I believe you. I believe you. The lady's going to give it to me. The lady's going to give it to me. The lady's going to give it to me. She's going to. She's going to. She's going to. And then I sheepishly walk up and say, I- "I'd like to cash this check, please." And then she gives it to me, and I'm like, ah, "I got the money. I got the money. I got the money." I got That's pretty silly, isn't it? Now think about this. All of the promises of heaven are already given to you. All of them. Every one of them. Everything that there is. And we're just like that at, the, at, the, at heaven's gates. We're going in there trying to get all, a little bitty tiny crumb that fell from the master's table. Some little bitty something. And we get it. And we jump up and down. And everybody in heaven's got to look at us and say, I don't understand these people. Are you all with me? I mean, I, I walk into my bank and I have full confidence. I walk in there, lay a check down, put it down, take cash, do whatever I want to, whatever transaction is going on. I don't question it. Just tell them to do it. Right? There's no doubt. Not an ounce of doubt. Do you see where we are in our, in our faith walk? 
We are jumping up and down from a prayer that gets answered. Thank God it got answered, but we got it answered. And it's the smallest, minuscule thing when the Bible says you've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And we're jumping up and down and doing the, you know, the charismatic chicken dance and whatever and just shouting hallelujah because we saw God move. Like we, that, that's almost saying that we didn't really think he was going to. Instead of walking in life, conducting business in life like a son of God. Folks, listen to me. Right now, your status, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, is joint heir with Christ Jesus. That's your status in heaven. Join heir. Your position is at the right hand of the throne of God with Christ. You say, well, I just don't believe it. There's my point. <laughs> I've used this example before. I can call the White House right now and ain't nobody going to talk to me. Pretty important place. Greatest nation on the face of the earth. I can call the White House and ain't nobody going to talk to me. I can want to talk to the president. He ain't going to talk to me. I can go down the line. I'm not going to find anybody that's going to talk to me. But you know what? The God that created the heavens and the earth and all therein. At the turn of my heart to him. Says, yeah, Robert, what do you need? I don't have to go through some big ritual. I don't have to go through some big, big, long, drawn out process of trying to get God to hear me. I don't have to get the incense burners going and the, you know, the candles lit and the atmosphere just right and the mood just right and get my wife to play and, you know, get all this and that and the other and create this perfect environment for me to go talk to him. I can be sitting in the middle of traffic at a stoplight and say, Dad, oh, Daddy, I need to talk to you. And he hears my cry. Now, that is amazing. That is amazing. So then, if we believe that God's Word is truly God Himself, Hear what I'm saying? When you open your Bibles, you believe that God's word is truly God himself. And he is faithful to perform what he's promised. Then that's what's going to come out of your mouth. When I read my Bible, I read my Bible as if it's the letter sent to me from heaven. So when I, I read Luke 6, 38, and it says, Given, it shall be given unto you. Good measures pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So men give unto your bosom. For the same measure you've been met, it would be measured back unto you. I said, oh, okay, God, you're a giver. Are you all following me here? When I see Psalms 107, 20, it says, He sent His word and He healed me and delivered me from all my destruction. Then you know what? I say, man, wow, God, you're a healing God. When I see that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I say, wow, you're a healing God. So then I had to confess every day, no matter what my body feels like. I had to confess every day, Father, I just thank you that you're, you're healing me. You're working in me. You're working in me a great work. I, this world can't kill me. I'm not going to die until the day that is appointed for me to die. I, my life is not going to be cut short. I'm going to see my children's children's children. I declare that I'm going to prosper and irritate the devil on the face of this earth as long as I possibly can. Now, do I always feel perfect? Do I have any physical problems? Sure. Sure I do. I don't move like I used to. You know what? I said, well, just shut up, body. Just keep going because we're going on. Am I smart to watch my health and to do that? Do the best I can. You follow what I'm saying here, church? 
But the confession that's coming out of my mouth is I'm going to live to see my children's children's children. And I'm not, my life's not going to be cut short. Amen. Now, I want you all to understand that, you know, uh, I'm not against doctors. Matter of fact, I use them to prove my doubts wrong. Did you hear what I said? I use them to prove that the doubt that's coming out of me is wrong. Like I was pretty well convinced a couple of years ago that I was bound to have a heart problem. And so I went, did the whole battery of tests, man. They put me on the stress machines. They did the EKGs, the echocardiograms. They did all that stuff. Look, did everything but just cut me wide open and pull my heart out and look at it. I get all through it. They say, well, you're healthy as a horse. I said, okay, thank you. That's what I need to hear. Then I just told my body, you shut up. Ain't nothing wrong with you. You get your little rumpus out there and let's go. There ain't nothing wrong with you. Whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking, shut up, head. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what's going on. Just shut up. I've got, I've got proof now. I can see with my eyes. See, I use them that way to shut my doubts up because the devil will always come into you and tell you the worst. I mean... You know, as humans, we tend to have that. We can get a hangnail and, and de- determine that it's turning into, you know, lupus. I don't even know if that fits, but it sounded good at the moment. Because <laughs> we're crazy. We're all crazy. I'm telling you, we're crazy because we have been inputted into our brains by what our surroundings of all around us and that has determined the life we're living. And I'm telling you, you've got to get out of that. You've got to get in here. You've got to believe that God's word is truly God himself speaking to you. And that he's faithful to perform everything that he has promised you. Hello? So we've got to start listening to our confession. Now I'm going to stop here because we're going to have communion this morning. I'm going to stop here because I've got tons more to go on on this thing. But listen to me. I want, to go, I want to carry this message on and this thought on because your rise and fall is all going to be about what's coming out of your mouth. And I want to say this. Religion wants to magnify cussing. But you know that there's a difference between cussing and cursing? I, I hope this will help somebody this morning. There's a big difference between cussing and cursing. It's not just the way you say it from up north to down south. Cussing is just using vulgar speech. Cursing is what comes out of your mouth that literally defiles you. And I'm telling you, to walk around and say you're stupid is a greater sin than cussing. If you smash your finger and you say a couple of four-letter words, well, whatever. I'm not so worried about that. Listen to me. I'm not so worried about that. You wake up in the morning and you said, oh, you're not going to make it today. You're such an idiot. You just cursed yourself. And God's a lot more displeased with that. So that old boy talks like a sailor. Yeah, but maybe he didn't curse anything. You, you see what I'm trying to shock you in here to? So I'm not condoning cussing. I'm just saying, I'm trying to shock you into what comes out of your mouth. Somebody could talk like a sailor and everybody goes, oh, what a horrible person. And this other nice little sweet person over here is just cursing themselves the whole time. And I'm telling you, God's more displeased with that. Because he wants you to be believing in him. He wants you to be standing in faith in him. He wants you to be saying, I'm blessed in city. I'm blessed in field. I'm blessed when I come and when I go. Lord, today you're just going to bless me. You said everything I put my hands to together 
I'm going to be blessed. I thank you, Lord, that, I'm, that you're, you're blessing my body. You're making me stronger. I'm healthier than I've ever been. I'm healthy like a horse. I'm like a wild steed in this life running because of God. You, you put the anointing and power of God. You're my strength. You're my shield. He said, well, that's just crazy talk. No, it's not. That's what the word of God says. And see, so we get it over into our, in our relationships and we say, man, Lord, that, that, that man that you gave me, he's an idiot. He's a stupid idiot. Oh, my God, he got no sense. Why does he do this? God, do something. But I want to tell you something. You know, it's amazing, the power of words. To walk up to your spouse and say, man, you are an awesome man of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully created in your mother's womb. You whoo, are an overcomer more than a conqueror. You can do things that nobody else in the world can do. You say, ah, oh, you're just lying. No, you're confessing the word of God over them. And you know what's going to happen? We'll get on into this later. When God's word is confessed, it goes into supernatural mode. And then God will see that his word gets performed. It takes place. Just like putting water on a plant. We don't know why we put water on, water on plant. We put water on plants because we know that if you put water on them, they'll grow, Right? We don't understand all the whole... We don't sit and think of all the physics about putting water on plants to make them grow, right? If you've got a tomato bush and you're watering your, your bushes and you're trying to produce tomatoes, you're not going out there and thinking of all the chemical process and all the da-da-da-da-da-da of what... You just could put water on the thing and grow. Keep the bugs off of it and you get tomatoes, right? Same thing with the Word of God. Quit trying to figure out how it all works to you get yourself so full of doubt... You know what I mean? And just figure out what works and do it. And I'll tell you what works. Right here. Get your mouth lined up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, well, put your Bibles up. And ladies, can I have you all bring down the communion? We're going to have communion here this morning. Laura, can you come on up and play something? Something pretty? Play a pretty song. Let me, just, let me just talk to you for just another second. I was really impressed last week when I was preaching the uh, rodeo or the bull riding over in Uvalde. And I, I was really, a lot of people came up and talked to me about listening to the radio. And it really blessed me because I know that they, they say that if one person says something, there's ten others that didn't say anything. And there was a lot of people that, that do listen. So they're sitting right here, and there's another whole giant church out there that's with you guys. And uh, I thought about that. It made me really have to stop and think that, you know, of what God has done with a little bit of faith. Because this whole radio broadcast, everything got started just by faith now I realize that there's thousands of people listening and it really really amazes me and so I want to talk to y'all and I want to talk to everybody out there listening and everybody watching today the most important thing you can ever do church is to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior it's the most important thing you could ever do it's that step that confidence on the inside of you to know that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior I'm telling you just like I said a while ago, when you make that step, everything is yours. It's not a learning process. I mean, it's not a, 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 a earning process. It's a learning process. You don't earn your way into heaven. You learn to apply the Word of God to your life. 
And so church, if you're here today or if you're listening or watching by video or audio, listen, Jesus loves you. He loves you. And if you've never made him the Lord and Savior of your life, today's your day. Today's the day to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. So I want everybody just to bow your heads for just a moment. Just look into your hearts and ask yourself that question. You got that confidence on the inside of you? That when you pray, Jesus hears your prayers? Have you got that confidence on the inside of you that that you know that you're righteous before him? Because the blood of Jesus has washed your sins away. If you're not really sure, then I just want to pray with you. Just right there, wherever you are, I just want to pray with you. And just lead you through a simple prayer. Because the Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, that Jesus comes into your life. Salvation is yours. So if you're in here today or if you're watching or listening, just lift your hand and say, Lord, that's me today. I I, I want you in my life. I want that confidence in my heart. I want it. Today's my day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For all of you listening, all of you watching, just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, today, I invite you into my life. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you gave your life for me. And today, I give my life to you. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me of all my sins and washing me in your blood. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Follow those Listen, listen. You pray that prayer from your heart today, the world's yours. All of heaven's yours. Amen? Good news. Good news. So, can I have my, now my pastoral team come down and uh, let me serve you in communion so that y'all can help me serve everybody else? It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. What Jesus did for us. The scriptures tell us on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, now take and eat for this is my body which was broken for you. The simple loaf of bread. Becomes our life come into our, by faith to come into our lives and change everything and touch everything that we need. His body was broken so yours could be mended. So Lord, we thank you today for this body, this bread, your body that was broken for us, Lord. And then he took the cup and he said, This is a new covenant that's poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sin. The old covenant was under the law and under works. The new covenant is all under grace through Jesus. Church, today, when you come up here, today is the day that whatever you've Whatever is bothering you, whatever is making you feel guilty about, today's the day to confess and say, Jesus, forgive me. And let his blood wash you and cleanse you again. To leave this building guilt free. Totally free by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for it.